Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Washington Brief for Tuesday, July 4, and Wednesday, July 5. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Jenkins, president of the Washington Times Foundation, which sponsors this webcast. Dr. Jenkins is also chairman of the Washington Times Holdings, the LLC that owns the Times News Organization. He's led many successful fact-finding trips to Korea for policy experts and peace initiatives to the Middle East for the Universal Peace Federation. Dr. Jenkins, welcome. Thank you, Larry, and thank you for all you do to help put together the Washington Brief. Welcome to our audience in America and throughout the world. Uh, our program this week uh, on July 4th is an excellent program highlighting the most significant uh, turn of events in Russia uh, recently. Our guest panelist is Mr. Daniel Hoffman, who's a Fox contributor and also serves on the advisory board of security consultant group BGO and works as an independent consultant. Before, before joining Fox News, Dan had a distinguished career with the Central Intelligence Agency, where he had, was a three-time station chief and a senior executive clandestine services officer. Mr. Hoffman also led large-scale intelligence gathering and technical programs, including tours of duty to the former Soviet Union, Europe, and war zones in the Middle East and South Asia. In addition, Dan served as director of CIA Middle East and North Africa Division. During his 30 years of government service, he also served with the U.S. military, including as an associate professor at the Army Command General Staff College. He has a Master of Science from London School of Economics and a Master's in Public Administration from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Our moderator today is Ambassador Joseph Dutran Dutrani, commentator on security issues, Formerly, Ambassador Dutrani was Special Envoy for the Six-Party Talks with North Korea and the Director of National Counterproliferation Center and Associate Director of National Intelligence. On our panel is Dr. Alexander Manzaroff. Dr. Manzaroff is an adjunct professor of security studies at the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He's also an adjunct professor of Korean studies at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins, and the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University. Ambassador Dutrani, welcome. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. A very special 4th of July uh, session we're having today with uh, Daniel Hoffman, someone I've known over the years, someone who really knows what's happening in the, uh, in the uh, Russian Federation. And uh, we're very fortunate to have him. Today, we'll be talking a lot, as, uh, as Michael indicated, uh, a, great, a great deal about Russia and what's happening and what happened with the recent short-lived insurrection of the, the Wagner Group and some other issues related to that. And we'll tie it into North Korea and China. Uh, and again, we have a special guest, Daniel Hoffman, who really is an expert on these issues. So Daniel, over to you, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks a lot. I'll just say a few uh, introductory words uh, about Russia, and I'm going to take us back a little bit and focus on Vladimir Putin and how he wound up where he is today. Vladimir Putin's formative experiences, he's a black belt in judo, and if you practice uh, martial arts, you know that in judo you try to use your opponent's strength against them. And he's done that pretty effectively against the United States using our wide open cyberspace, among other things. Uh, to conduct influence operations, but he was also a KGB officer, and he served an overseas tour in East Germany. He likes to fashion himself as a, uh, a sly intelligence officer. He ran Russia's federal security service, the FSB. But what's important to remember about Vladimir Putin is that he never rose to the ranks, uh, the senior ranks of Russia's intelligence services. He was a very junior officer when he left the KGB, when the Soviet Union was collapsing, and went to work for the mayor of St. Petersburg, Anatoly Sobchak. Now, how Putin came to power, also interesting, the former Soviet Union collapsed, uh, or the Soviet Union collapsed, and, and the only pieces of it that arguably didn't collapse were Russia's intelligence services. There was no rule of law, the infrastructure was falling apart, but the FSB, the Foreign Intelligence Service, the SVR, and the Military Intelligence Service, the GRU, were all 
uh, effectively operating, including against the United States, running high profile penetrations of our government, including Rick Ames uh, and recently deceased Robert Hansen. And it's probably no surprise, it couldn't have come to much of a surprise to us that rising from that ash heap of history was a KGB guy, Vladimir Putin. And he made a deal with Boris Yeltsin. Uh, Russians like to say, Svayaru Bashka, Blizia Katelo, your own shirt is closest to your skin. And Boris Yeltsin, in return for immunity, which Putin granted him on the first day uh, acting when he was acting president, January 1st of 2000, uh, Yeltsin gave the KGB guy uh, the keys to the kingdom, even though Yeltsin had risen up himself uh, to fight the KGB coup of 1991. I'll return to that in a moment. But what we've seen over the past 20 years with Vladimir Putin are increasingly intense, brazen attacks, first on his neighbors and then on the West writ large. So initially it was a cyber attack, a massive DDoS attack against Estonia This in, in, in April of 2007. This after getting Russia's own house in order by launching a brutal campaign to subdue Chechnya and turn it over to a warlord, Kadyrov, who is now helping Putin in, in Ukraine. Then Russia invaded Georgia in 2008 and took control of Ossetia. After that, uh, it was on to, uh, to Ukraine, where Russia illegally annexed by force Crimea and, and areas of the Donbass. Uh, this after the Russian uh, puppet Yanukovych was removed from power and Putin realized that there really wasn't going to be another option for Russia to deal with the threat that he felt Ukraine posed to the Russian Federation. And we all know about the Russian efforts to interfere in U.S. elections 2016 and onward in particular. Um, but the key for Ukraine and, and what Ukraine exposed about Vladimir Putin is that what scares him the most is democracy. It's not enemy at the gates. He likes to portray NATO as a, as a uh, very capable uh, military force that is militarily threatening Russia. That is not true. Russia... Putin knows that, his intelligence service know that NATO is a defensive alliance and has no aim to launch any offensive strikes. But what does concern Putin is that Ukraine, uh, with this sizable Russian-speaking population, was seeking to join the European Union and NATO. And when Ukraine was invited to join NATO with a, to develop a membership action plan in 2008, along with Georgia, that's what did it for Vladimir Putin. That's why Russia invaded Georgia to prevent Georgia from joining uh, NATO, and it's ultimately why Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine in 2014 and then again in 2022, all to, to prevent Ukraine uh, from becoming a democracy, which would threaten Russia. Because if you look at the Baltic states, for example, flourishing democracies, economically vibrant, commercially linked to, the, to Western Europe, militarily, strategically as well, and you look at the, the, the standard of living in Russia and the fact that a young a young person in Russia, uh, born today, is going to live about as long as a kid who's born in Haiti. Russia's GDP, the size of Italy's. No disrespect to the Italians, but it's not that great. And that's why Putin relies on on relatively cheap form of asymmetric espionage to level the playing field. Now, the irony, and there's a whole host of ironies in Russian history, is that Vladimir Putin, the supposed brilliant uh, spy master, committed just extraordinary intelligence failures. He failed accurately to assess the will and capacity of Ukraine to fight. Now we failed too. We gave President Zelensky a plane to, to you know, evacuate him when Russia launched their invasion in February of 2022. And Zelensky uh, prophetically said, you know, and very eloquently said, I don't need a plane, I need ammunition. The war is here. How about that for a pithy statement of Ukraine's war aim? Um, and their commitment to fight. But, but Putin underestimated Ukraine. He underestimated Zelensky's leadership and Zelensky's capacity to awaken NATO from its post-Cold War slumber. We can thank Zelensky for doing that. Ukraine has done more than any country in the history of NATO to counter, defend, and deter Russian aggression. And I think that's something that we're going to be hearing a lot of during the upcoming NATO summit next week, the role that, uh, that Ukraine has played. Now, turning to the Wagner uh, insurrection. It wasn't a coup. The Yevgeny Prigozhin, former hot dog salesman and, and convict, um, had no intention of, of removing Putin from power. His, his 
conflict was with the Minister of Defense Shoigu and the Army Chief of Staff Gerasimov. He's been in conflict with them for many years. They were been competing for influence and for resources in Africa as well as in Syria. And Prigozhin also, like Putin, doesn't have a background, a deep one at least, in intelligence, tactically, never served. Doesn't have a background in the military. And yet he was out there on the front lines with his guys, leading them to slaughter in Bakhmut, 20,000 of them, roughly, dead, reportedly. And this was the critical moment, I think, one of them at least in this war, where again, President Zelensky was right. The Biden administration, going back to March of 2023, was publicly stating that Ukraine could withdraw from Bakhmut and not face, uh, you know, that it would be okay that they wouldn't face any tactical or strategic uh, cost for doing that. But Zelensky made the decision to stand and to fight because Zelensky realized this was the opportunity for Ukraine to drive a wedge between the Wagner mercenaries who were on the front lines cannon fodder in that bloody battle in Bakhmut and Russia's Ministry of Defense. And that was the turning point. That was the spark, I think, that lit this insurrection because Prigozhin, if he doesn't blame Shoigu for the 20,000 dead Wagner mercenaries, he, that's an existential threat to his leadership position for the Wagner group and for the Internet Research Agency, which is under indictment and now targeted by the Russian Federal Security Service, the FSB. I'll get to that in a moment. But that was the, the key strategic benefit of fighting in Bakhmut. And yes, Ukraine lost many of its soldiers, but the fight was worth it because now Wagner is has been taken out of uh, Russia's military formation. And what Prigozhin publicly called out uh, the farce that this war is and said there was no... All of the pretexts for war, denazifying Ukraine, demilitarizing Ukraine, none of those things was true. And Prigozhin called it out very, very accurately. And I think Vladimir Putin has to think of, of Wagner almost as a, as a virus that seeped into the Russian military. Remember, the Wagner group went in unopposed and took the Rostov military district, which is responsible for leading, directing Russia's military activity and operations inside Ukraine. And Wagner went in there without firing a shot and had their discussions with the Russian military about the war. That's got to have a long-term impact on Ru the Russian military's morale going forward. But there are limits to how much this will impact the war and how much it will impact Vladimir Putin. So first on the war, the challenge for Ukraine along that 600-mile border with Russia uh, as they seek to retain, re retake territory in Donetsk, in, in the Donbass and Luhansk and Donetsk, and potentially to retake Crimea, massive amount of mines that are going to slow Ukraine's offensive. It's one thing for Ukraine to be on the defensive, but going on the offensive, where typically you need a three to one ratio of attackers to defenders, extraordinarily challenging. And we failed Ukraine. We haven't given Ukraine the attack them long range artillery that they need. We didn't give them the Abrams tanks and they don't have F-16s to give them the close air support that they desperately need to take the fight to the Russian military. And that is arguably, those are the reasons why we're seeing a slow start to this counteroffensive. Yes, Ukraine has held back some of their most trained uh, and capable troops, but at the same time, and this is a story throughout the war, we have failed to give Ukraine what they need when they need it in the most timely manner. And that is the only success Vladimir Putin has enjoyed in this war. Rhetorical nuclear brinkmanship that has induced a level of escalation paralysis on the part of the Biden administration. First, we weren't giving the Ukrainians the Patriot air defense uh, and the HIMAR uh, shorter range artillery. And now we're not giving them the uh, military equipment that I just mentioned. Again, all because every time we talked about doing it, Vladimir Putin would say that, that we're risking Armageddon and World War III, and that struck a chord. Mr. Detrani will remember from CIA, he and I, engaged with analysts. And one of our things that our leadership analysts would often do is, is study historical placement. So for example, when President George Herbert Walker Bush had to deal with Saddam's invasion of Kuwait, he likened it to Hitler and not appeasing Hitler as we did and giving them the Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia. And so we couldn't appease Saddam. We couldn't let that stand when Saddam took Kuwait. Similarly, President Biden grew up during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Vladimir Putin has used that to his advantage. That's the only success Putin has enjoyed in this war, but he spilled a massive amount of blood and treasure. 
of Russian blood and treasure, not to mention what he's done to the world economy and obviously Ukrainian civilians bombing hospitals, maternity wards, uh, civilian neighborhoods, and, and limiting Ukraine's ability to export wheat to the global economy. So the question is, what is the impact on Vladimir Putin? Well, the difference between today and 1991, when the KGB launched their failed coup attempt, and that was a coup attempt against Gorbachev, is that there was someone waiting in the wings, Boris Yeltsin, who did as much as anybody to cause the collapse of the Soviet Union. There is no Boris Yeltsin in Russia. Vladimir Putin has successfully dealt with whatever populist left-wing uh, uh, political opposition might have existed. The opposition to Vladimir Putin is to the right. And if Vladimir Putin is removed because people recognize that his strategy on Ukraine is taking the country in a place where they shouldn't be going and it's threatening the elites in Russia, then we could see some kind of an internal coup. But Vladimir Putin made it clear he sided with his most trusted loyal allies, that's Shoigu, uh, the National Security Advisor, Patrushev, who used to serve as Director of FSB, and the Director of FSB, Bortnikov. He didn't go with his longtime friend, uh, Prigozhin. So where it leaves us is, yes, a weakened Vladimir Putin. Yes, he's, you know, his, his war aims have been exposed for what they are. But just judging by his recent walkabout in Dagestan last week, where he was kissing uh, his loyal fans there, I'm not sure that there's an incredibly negative impact on Vladimir Putin's capability or ability to, to, to continue to lead Russia. That said, he the longer Russia carries on with this war, the weaker Putin gets, the weaker he gets, the more he feels like he has to carry on with the war. At some point, there'll be a breaking point. Autocracies are brittle. Russia will break. And the big challenge for our intelligence community is to determine uh, what happens next. Now, one last point about China and some of the, the, the shocks to, to geopolitics that we've seen from this. The Biden administration, rightly so, has taken advantage of uh, the opening to India, because India sees Russia and China getting a little bit closer, and that concerns India since China is its primary um, adversary. And so the Biden administration taking advantage of that uh, with some good outreach to India. China has made a deal. They have made Russia into their resource colony importing cheap hydrocarbons, exporting crappy Chinese manufactured goods, and usurping Russia's uh, uh, throw weight in Russia's traditional sphere of influence. So Xi Jinping visited uh, Tajikistan, uh, Turkmenistan uh, a few months back. China is pushing economically into Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, places where Russia operates. And Ukraine's largest trading partner before the war was China. And China was would like to get back in on reconstructing Ukraine, although the West, NATO, will never let them do it. Uh, that's in the back of their mind. And we know now that China has this, this SIG and spy base. They've been operating in Cuba for four years. That's also a traditional Russian outpost, not to mention South America, which is China's, uh, which is um, trading with China at, at a high level. The highest, uh, the, the greatest trading partner for South America is China. And China's made inroads with Venezuela as well and Nicaragua, Brazil. Uh, these are, not to mention Africa and, and, and the Middle East where China is, 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 is marching onward and it's a zero sum game. Russia, China are long-term strategic adversaries and China is taking advantage and exploiting Russia's weakness. So do they have a little buyer's remorse with Vladimir Putin? I don't think so. They're happy to have a weakened Vladimir Putin that they can exploit and they will hedge in the event that Putin is overthrown and there might be some Russian who replaces him and decides that Russia shouldn't be China's resource colony and they should re-engage with Europe, China will seek to do everything they can to make sure that doesn't happen, including interfering in Russia's internal affairs. So the, the war has, has shocked not only the region, not only Ukraine, not, not only uh, NATO members, especially the Baltic states and Poland, but it's extended out with Iran providing drones and North Korea providing artillery and China providing at least some diplomatic cover, but limiting uh, what military supplies they'll give Russia, cognizant that coming out of their COVID lockdown, they can't afford to break relations uh, with the West. And Putin knows that. Putin and she will be meeting at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization virtually uh, tomorrow. And I'm sure that Vladimir Putin will look for some Potemkin village uh, maybe um, open 
comments from pres from President Xi about the, the limitless partnership they have. But at the end of the day, Vladimir Putin is on his knees begging for whatever he can get from China. So let me stop there and uh, we can open it up for any questions. And, and maybe I'll leave it to Joe to you to talk more about about China and, and over to you know on North Korea as well. They're great topics. Thank you so much, Dan. That was just outstanding. And uh, I'm going to be looking to Alexander. Let me just say there's so much to unpack in what, what you said about the uh, what's going on in, in, in Russia and the war in Ukraine and the, uh, the uh, short-lived insurrection and what that means for the viability of the leadership of uh, Putin in Russia, but also the relationship with China, which is so important. And as you said, China is benefiting a great deal with the cheap oil and the uh, and and gas coming in from uh, from uh, from Russia, uh, so yes, there's a lot there. And and then you uh, you talked about uh, even North Korea. North Korea has been a great supporter of the Russian Federation and 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 President and Putin. So there's a lot to unpack. Uh, I'm going to look to my colleague uh, Alexander Monsadov, Dr. Monsadov, and if you could comment and some questions, and then we'll open it up. Okay. Dr. Mansadov. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings, everyone. And Dan, uh, thank you for your uh, illuminating and very forceful uh, presentation. I mean, you uh, raised a number of uh, very interesting points, and definitely you have a perspective. And it's, a, uh, it's an important perspective. It's the mainstream perspective here uh, in this country. And what I have to say may be uh, may sound as politically incorrect, uh, because uh, I'm going to present, if you wish, uh, an alternative, uh, I hope competitive perspective on uh, what is going on today. Uh, in my opinion, uh, what we see in Ukraine, obviously, is a tragedy. Uh, it's a civil war, whether uh, people like it or not, uh, within the same people. Uh, and uh, it, it costs, what, 400,000 plus lives on both sides. It's a real uh, tragedy, even personal tragedy. At the same time, it's a proxy war, uh, which, uh, you know, NATO countries are waging against Russia on the Ukrainian battlefield. I mean, Russians like to call it a total hybrid warfare because it affects all dimensions of uh, uh, the relationship. But the bottom line, it's a tragedy. And, uh, you know, the leaders uh, of Russia, of uh, other countries involved, I think are responsible for that. Yes, uh, President Putin uh, you know, bears a tremendous responsibility for letting it happen under his watch. Uh, there is no question about it. But the thesis that uh, Russia is losing and we are winning, I think, uh, you know, the evidence does not support it. And, uh, uh, I'll uh, be very brief, but on the battlefield, as you know, uh, the Ukrainian uh, long expected counteroffensive uh, has failed to make any meaningful gains, uh, despite despite the huge Western assistance, and you uh, attributed it to the mining fields uh, laid out there. But there are many uh, different factors why uh, we 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 see that. If anything, uh, you know, now is the tipping moment when it's time probably for Russia to go on its own counteroffensive, if you wish, and it's not happening. And my question is why not? And definitely it's not because Russia exhausted its resources or not, but I would attribute it to the lack of political will. And later when I talk about the Prigozhin surprising, uh, you know, I will uh, kind of try to tie it back uh, to the failure of Russia to go on to counteroffensive. Now, on the diplomatic front, again, the uh, Western attempts to impose a cordon sanitaire uh, on Russia, in my opinion, proved to be ineffective. Uh, again, Russian diplomatic isolation is a myth. Uh, it's, yes, uh, relations with the West are cut off, severed, but that's not the first time it happened in Russian history. If anything, relations with the global East, global South, uh, they're expanding widely. Yes, Russia failed to stop NATO's eastward expansion. Uh, but as you know, uh, Russia always regarded Sweden as part of the, the broader uh, kind of NATO uh, defense arrangements. Uh, Finland was a surprise, but uh, 
uh, again, an unpleasant surprise, but nevertheless, the uh, red line really was uh, the former states of the Soviet Union, uh, especially uh, Georgia and Ukraine, and that's where Russians are taking a stand. And uh, the, the very clear, and as Medvedev wrote in his article, uh, I think yesterday, uh, that uh, they're not going to let an anti-Russia emerge in either one of these places. Again, on the economic front, I know with the, uh, you know there's a gloom and doom uh, kind of avalanche in this country that the Russian economy is falling apart. Uh, but in my opinion, it's uh, ground. These claims are groundless. I mean, facts just do not support it. Yes, uh, Russia could have been doing much better uh, had it not uh, launched that war. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, all these uh, you know, predictions that uh, you know, Russian economy would collapse. Uh, they, uh, they they just uh, have no grounds. Yes, it's deglobalizing. Uh, yes, it's pivoting uh, to uh, to the east. Uh, and I uh, agree with you completely at the expense uh, of uh, Russian businesses because everybody from Turkey to China uh, to Iran to its African partners now are taking advantage of the situation uh, when Russians are trying to rebuild their supply chains uh, they rely increasingly on parallel imports and when really they have to build some of the industries, major industries, uh, uh, whether it's uh, car manufacturing, aviation manufacturing, chip building, uh, chip manufacturing, whatever, from scratch, uh, which is very hard to do. It's very capital intensive labor, uh, you, you know, they, they lack labor, etc. But nevertheless, uh, uh, you know, Russian economy is still vibrant, if anything, it's growing maybe pre predominantly because of the military industrial complex, which is uh, being revived and it's uh, uh, growing at a very fast pace. Now, uh, but most interesting aspect of what's going on, I think on the, on the domestic policy front. And in my opinion, uh, Prigozhin's uh, quote unquote armed rebellion uh, was an imitation and that's then where I disagree with you. I think it was an imitation of an insurrection. Really, it was a charade, in my opinion, concocted by President Putin himself. I mean, you look at Karamurza, uh, uh, one of the liberal opposition thinkers in Russia. He's in jail. Why? Because he said something, uh, you know, which the regime didn't like. And so they threw him in jail for many years. And yet the man who... Uh, allegedly organized an armed insurrection at the time of war was slapped on the wrist, you know, allowed to uh, go to Belarus and basically uh, to maintain most of his uh, assets. So I think, uh, you know, this was a charade, which was uh, uh, maybe, I, I don't know whether Prigozhin was used in a blind fashion or whether he was part of that scheme, uh, but uh, again, on the surface, Putin's domestic political approval ratings uh, sky high over 80 percent. But the reality is the elites are split. Uh, the population does not like uh, the war, as you correctly pointed out. I mean, we have a party of war uh, and a party of not peace, really, but uh, those who sit on the fence and wait until it's all over and they can get back to the business as usual, you know, the way it used to be. Uh, before 2022. But the party of war really is uh, looking at the uh, failures of Russian intelligence service, of Russian uh, military to make significant advances uh, for over almost like a year and a half. And they want uh, accountability. I mean, they demand more action. They demand faster action, bolder action, more aggressive action, and more substantive reforms, if you wish, of the government bureaucracy of the military. And so, in my opinion, by orchestrating uh, Prigozhin's challenge, so to speak, uh, President Putin, on the one hand, delegitimized the political challenges from the patriotic right the hardliners, the conservative, who demand more action, bolder action on the battlefront, who demand a military offensive, actually. And really, you know, the accomplishment, the achievement of those goals, which he stated, and you referred to some of them, denazification, demilitarization uh, of Ukraine and others. So uh, that's one thing. He delegitimized all these people 
because now anyone who raises a voice of uh, criticism will be immediately you know, lumped together uh, with Prigozhin and uh, basically marginalized and ostracized. Also possibly he laid the groundwork for uh, another round of mobilization, believe it or not, because now the decision was made that prisoners can no longer be uh, used in uh, uh, manning uh, the troops. So what's left then, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, the regular folks, ordinary folks. Uh, and of course, uh, now there is a legitimate case uh, for popular mobilization. Uh, now, of course, he consolidated the military command and control system under the general staff and the Ministry of Defense. I mean, you, you talked about uh, that, uh, uh, you know, one of the wins for Ukraine was uh, the elimination of Wagner is one of the most effective combat uh, units in Russia. And uh, yes, that's exactly true. But uh, remember that Wagner uh, earned over $20 billion. I mean, that's astounding number, which was just made public the other day uh, by the Kremlin, that it was not for free. It was not like prison labor. You know, it was a commercial enterprise uh, which earned $20 billion uh, if, in its mercy services. Also, the reason why I think Putin did it, orchestrating this rebellion, uh, was because he wanted to send a message, send a message to the West that if you remove me, it was all about him. If you remove me, then you'll get someone as crazy as Prigozhin, you know, uh, uh, who will, you know, not hesitate to press that nuclear button, you know, put his finger on the. So it's part of that nuclear brinkmanship, which you referred to in your presentation. You, you know, if I'm gone, people like Prigozhin will come to power, not liberal Democrats, uh, you, know, you know, whom you like, but, you know, the darker forces uh, from Siberia, they'll take over, and then you, you'll be really in trouble. And that's why, uh, you know, we, we see an article like uh, Medvedev, uh, which was published, in which basically uh, he outlined his vision of the future, uh, which includes a global confrontation with the West, not just Russia against NATO, uh, which he believes will last many, many, uh, not just years, but decades. Uh, and in his opinion, and this is the uh, number two guy in the Russian power hierarchy, I mean, formally, at least, uh, I, I believe he's still a member of Putin's team. He is not his uh, own man. I mean, uh, he's just a function uh, at this point, just like he was uh, during his tenure, but uh, he predicts that things will get much worse before they get better. Uh, and specifically, what does it mean uh, worse? Uh, in his opinion, it means the total annihilation, that's the word he uses, annihilation, the Kiev regime, uh, the Ukrainian government, basically, he advocates for the uh, break off of diplomatic relations uh, with the United Kingdom, uh, with other hostile countries like Poland, uh, Finland, former Baltic states. I mean, this is uh, uh, former President Medvedev saying, I mean, he talks about the need to eliminate uh, such uh, what he called freak organizations as the International Criminal Court, uh, Council of Europe, OSCE, uh, total overhaul of the United Nations. And of course, uh, as ultimate kind of uh, stage, it can be done through a, uh, another round of Helsinki uh, style negotiate Helsinki Act, remember 1975, but not of course in Helsinki this time. And if not, then just like you suggested, I mean, he uh, basically again uh, goes into that path of nuclear brinkmanship and says that nuclear catastrophe uh, will be the alternative if you don't accept uh, all these uh, uh, all these uh, offers. So Alexander, I, I don't want to again to finish it. Let me just ask okay, a question. Go ahead. I mean, uh, get this question. is an alternative perspective. Right, right. Now, uh, Dan, I, I know you'll have a lot probably to comment on what I said, but this is a legitimate disagreement. You know, who is winning, who is losing, why, and what does it mean for all of us? Uh, but my question to you really is: uh, What's the end game uh, for the United States? What's the end game for Russia? Do you see it as the uh, elimination of Putin's regime, as the dismantlement of the Russian Federation, or uh, are these extremes uh, which uh, you don't want to contemplate and you see the end game somewhere else? 
Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Please. Daniel. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, I would respectfully disagree with a lot of what you said. I don't think Putin is the puppeteer here. I don't think he orchestrated this. But uh, and one quick note for you. Putin publicly said that he gave Wagner $1 billion for the catering business and $1 billion to pay for the mercenaries. In one year. And, and that's a lot. The next day, the Kremlin said yeah. $20 billion. So right. it's like 10 times more. So I was going to say it's a precursor to bringing potentially financial crimes against them. But there's no question that there's a purge going on of Wagner. But as far as the end game, let's just be clear that Russia's end game was thwarted. Vladimir Putin wanted to take Kiev and he failed to do it. What resulted? A brain drain. One million Russians fled. That's more than by three times. Well, half of them are back now, as you know. Please, Alexander, please. Okay. Um, well, Daniel, please. Uh, anyway, um, that and the fact that Russia's, you know, military equipment and their logistics and morale are all pretty shoddy. Um, and Ukraine's courageous defense has resulted in Ukraine defending their territory. So that's been the success so far. The Biden administration has consistently said this ends when Ukraine ends it, how Ukraine ends it. And so Ukraine has made it clear that they've lost too many, too many dead women and children and millions of displaced Ukrainians. They're not going to stop until they take Crimea and Donbass. Now, Russia may prevent that from happening, but those are Ukraine's war aims. And if that happens, I would say with some level of confidence at CIA, we used to, there's no certainty in anything except love. I know I love my wife and kids. Beyond that, I'm not certain about anything. But I would say with some medium level of confidence that if Ukraine were to take Crimea and Donbass, Vladimir Putin would be no longer would be sitting in the Kremlin. And so that's the, the challenge for the, United, for the United States, which is if Ukraine's war aims are the war aims, that is to regain Crimea and Donbass, which is theirs. If you look back at 1991, I'd go back and debate history and all that stuff. But Russia signed the Budapest Accord back in 1991. Ukraine gave up their nuclear weapons, and Russia said they would respect Ukraine's, modern Ukraine's territorial integrity. They didn't do that. They launched a brutal war, unprovoked of aggression instead. And so the Biden administration has kind of dodged whether there's an end game or not. And I believe they should say what the end game is, and I think they should be more forceful about it. And they could say to the Russians, I mean, if I were imagining myself as presumptuous as it might seem that I was sitting in the White House, I would say, hey, let's just tell the Russians there's no off ramp for the war criminal Vladimir Putin. But for Russia, there is. If Russia wants to stop being China's resource colony and restart its relationship with Europe economically, and the elites could send their kids to schools in Europe and all those things that, that everyone would like to see happen, great. Just Get out of Ukraine and don't invade other countries and we can get back to to having productive relationship and you can do away with this uh, this relationship with China that is not in Russia's short or long term interests. But we're not really doing that either. Uh, and that I you know, I think this is going to be an issue and, and I don't know where it ends. I don't know where we're going to call it on the end game, but I do know it's going to be an issue in this presidential campaign increasingly in the United States and. On both on the Republican side, there will be a lot of debate about what the end game is, what it should be. And I'm sure there will be debates with President Biden over that publicly when when the Republican nominee debates President Biden about what we see the future of Ukraine uh, and Russia looking like. But no one has said that we're after regime change in Russia and no one would in this administration, nor perhaps should they, though, I think if you say that Ukraine should have their territory back. That's essentially what you're saying. And um, that's that's where this is going to get pretty dicey, because, uh, as I said before, we could all see in 1991 that when Gorbachev didn't decided not to pursue overly repressive measures to tear to, to try to in, ensure that he could remain in power, he walked away and it was a relatively uh, blood free transfer of power, not a democratic one, but at least not so bloody. But there was somebody waiting in the wings, Boris Yeltsin, who was a populist politician who had grown up and had a level of support in the country. There's nothing like that today. And the concern that I would have, I think we would all agree, is what, what what's after Putin? Well, he's the KGB guy. You don't have, I always said in Russia, if you think it's going to get better, it's probably not. I lived there for five years. It's usually going to get worse. And if you can solve today's problem by creating a bigger one for tomorrow, that's also okay. And that's what you see. So 
look, if there's one silver lining in all these dark clouds, it's the chance for all of us here to gather and debate and talk about this. Uh, and it's interesting and it's impactful for the rest of the world. But gosh, I have to be honest with you. I don't have that much hubris to believe that I could answer any of these any of these super hard questions. Thank you. That, no, no. Let me, I follow up let me, with let, you, I'm sorry, Alexander, please. Let me have the prerogative okay. of entering yeah. here. No problem. Uh, Daniel, uh, no, excellent responses to uh, Alexander's uh, very good questions. Let me just posit a few things and then ask a question and then open it up to you, Alexander and, 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 and Daniel. Uh, look, you know, someone who is not as expert as, as, as Daniel Hoffman and Alexander Mansurov, uh, looking at it, uh, one has to have a sense that the Wagner Group, uh, Przovkin, this is a man who is a populist. I mean, it, 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 this short-lived insurrection, and I say it's an insurrection because I have to agree with uh, Mr. Hoffman on this. It, it seems like there was a there was there was some sentiment here for uh, whether it's the oligarchs or what have you uh, of of people supporting a populist who was saying enough we don't like the war in ukraine uh why did we do it and why are we losing all these lives and so forth well at least that's sort of what i i see and therefore my question to uh, mr hoffman is, is is this if if you're looking at if you're looking at this uh, short-lived insurrection and it just looked like one and one has to wonder about the viability of putin himself i mean if he if he, uh, if he showed an element of weakness, and I think Alexander put it well, I mean, he slapped the Prizokin on, on the hands. He's in Belarus and, and uh, he's probably got some money and, and so forth. I mean, he's, he's not being incarcerated or what have you. So one has to wonder about, he handled this, uh, uh, Putin did, uh, uh, maybe in a skillful way, but he showed elements of weakness. And that element, uh, element of weakness in, in, a, in, a, in a country like that, I would imagine with the, uh, with the strong players uh, around him, uh, uh, I, I, what is the viability? Does this go forward? And, and you mentioned China, and I totally agree with your comments on China because I, I think uh, President Xi Jinping is, is getting the oil and other benefits from this relationship with the Russian Federation. But, but President Xi Jinping in the People's Republic of China is losing a lot of credibility by aligning himself, I, I think, uh, with the Russian Federation, with Putin and his war in, in Ukraine. I, 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 I think Xi Jinping would like to see, uh, uh, to maintain a good relationship with the European Union, uh, with other countries, with their Belt and Road Initiative, and certainly even with the United States, they don't want to talk about economic decoupling. So aligning himself with the Russian Federation, I could see maybe the Democratic People's Republic of, of Korea, the North Koreans, supporting Putin and the war in Ukraine. But for, for China, it's a, it's a little different uh, because China is a global, a near peer competitor with the United States. So my two questions are this. The viability of Putin showing, I think, weakness in his response to the Wagner group and this short-lived insurrection. How viable is he? Uh, and what would possibly follow Putin? Uh, Medvedev and, and others are there. Uh, would it be worse? Or what is your sense on that? And secondly, why would China, do you think China would persist with the support of, of at least the alignment with the Russian Federation, uh, knowing that uh, a peaceful resolution, at least a ceasefire, uh, would would probably meet China's demands at this time. What's your sense on those 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 questions, uh, Daniel Hoffman? Yeah. So, uh, what the lasting images for me of this Wagner insurrection? It was not a coup attempt because there wasn't really a direct effort to overthrow Vladimir Putin. Although it's a distinction without a difference for Vladimir Putin. Uh, but Wagner shot down six helicopters and an aircraft. They reportedly killed 13 to 15 Russian airmen. So it was a pretty it was pretty serious. And they were on their way to Moscow and Moscow had had prepared for a bloodbath. And what the way Putin solved this very interesting, because he's talked in the past about how he, when he was a child, he met a cornered rat in a, you know, burned out apartment in St. Petersburg. And he learned that when the rat's cornered, the rat's going to strike you. And Vladimir Putin didn't do that, at least not yet. 
um, he allowed he allowed Prigozhin to negotiate essentially uh, a ceasefire between the two of them. And Prigozhin is is not necessarily. I'm not sure he's in Belarus. He he's reportedly been in in Saint Petersburg. Uh, there's no question that that the FSB is taking over Wagner. They have already today in the Internet Research Agency um, seizing uh, Internet Research Agency media and other things. So. The Wagner Group will come under the control of, of Russia's security service, and Prigozhin will cease to be a real player. Now, the question is, like, is he a canary in the coal mine? Because I'll tell you, there was an interview, and Alexander will remember this interview Vladimir Putin gave to a very obsequious Russian journalist years ago. And the journalist said, Vladimir Vladimirovich, it seems like you could forgive anything. Is there anything you wouldn't forgive? And Putin gives him the KGB stare and says, Bridatistva, treachery. That's why he sent his goons to, to the UK to, to poison uh, Sergei Skripal, the Russian military intelligence defector with, with a Soviet banned Soviet nerve agent, Novichok. Not because Skripal matters much, but because he has to show his own guys that he's ruthless and that he will deal with traitors that way. That's why he killed uh, Boris Nemtsov, who was a nothing op opponent, political opponent. Back in 2015, Putin ordered his assassination. Nimtsov was not a threat to Putin, but Putin needs to show his own security services that anyone who even thinks about getting out of line is going to face a new polonium-210, as Litvinenko did, Novichok, bullet in the back of the head, one of those nasty things. He didn't do that with Prigozhin. And so that is something that I'm sure our intelligence community is looking at. How does Vladimir Putin navigate the aftermath of this failed insurrection? More repression, I would expect that. Definitely looking to root out those Wagner mercenaries who were supporting, uh, who were supporting Prigozhin and supporting the insurrection. Take a look at General Suravikin, who was involved in the 1991 coup, who got the name of butcher of our of the butcher of Syria and General Armageddon for his uh, war, war crimes in Chechnya. He's one of Prigozhin's close confidants and was reportedly detained for days. What happens to him going forward? I'm not so sure that he has much of a future either, but I, th this, this, this is going to take some time to play out. And how it plays out, I'm, again, is something I'm sure we're tracking closely. Where it leads, there will be post-Putin. How we get to post-Putin is very, very critical. Whether Putin gets a bullet in the back of his head, I mean, it's he's such a savvy operator who's been around for two decades because He's careful and he's a KGB operator and he has enough of the Federal Security Service, the FSB, standing behind him to collect on threats to him that maybe he's going to be OK. But this war has put incredible stress on that uh, infrastructure, that security infrastructure in Vladimir Putin's midst. And that would be the question. I will tell you, based on my experience at CIA, having served in Russia for many years, whatever happens, we're not going to see it. Because these guys aren't going to come up for air the way Prigozhin did. They're going to do this behind the scenes in such a way that Vladimir Putin's guys aren't going to be able to find them and kill them first before they take action against Putin. So whether this Prigozhin failed insurrection was a dress rehearsal, might have been. There have been a lot of, of, of rebellions and attempted uh, mutinies in Russia in the past. And I'll just last thing I'll say is war has never been kind to Russia. In 1905, there was a failed revolution when Russia fought Japan, which was a precursor for the Bolshevik revolution in 1917. Stalin was so worried about the possibility of, of a mutiny and a coup that he purged his own forces. Millions of, of Russian military and intelligence officers were killed on the eve of the Nazi invasion precisely for that reason. And the war in Afghanistan put a few nails in the Soviet evil empire's coffin as well. Vladimir Putin hasn't followed that path so much. He hasn't purged, he hasn't killed millions uh, in his security services or the military. I would say he's co-opted them and corrupted them into this Russian kleptocracy, which is a mafia state. But it's brittle and it's not going to end well for Vladimir Putin, for Russia, the region, the world, the United States. I mean, this is a very significant challenge for us. And I think for the United States, um, one of the key requirements, intelligence requirements, it's so opaque in Russia that we rely on our intelligence community there arguably as much as anywhere. Just like North Korea, China, Iran, transnational terrorism, these are extraordinarily hard targets.
Thank you, Dan. Let me let, let me just the, the last question on Xi Jinping in China. Do you think uh, <clears throat> Xi Jinping is is encouraging Vladimir Putin to look for an off ramp, to look for a ceasefire, to end this thing? Because it's it, I don't think it's in China's interest to continue to align themselves with uh, with this war in Ukraine. I think Xi Jinping understands that his leverage just isn't that great right now over Vladimir Putin. This is an existential fight for Putin. And I think China wants to hedge for themselves. In the event that Ukraine goes on a blistering counteroffensive like we saw last year in Kherson and starts taking territory at a rapid rate, which I, I agree with Alexander, I don't see that happening in the near term. But if that were to happen, that's where China pulls out their awful peace plan, which Ukraine would never agree to anyways, and tries to broker a ceasefire on behalf of Putin to keep Putin on the throne because they're using him and exploiting him. Uh, okay. There's a naughty word to describe what Putin is. I won't say it because maybe people out there speak Russian, but Alexander knows what I'm thinking about. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> that's what Putin is to China. Um, very subservient lapdog, uh, but worse than that. And so they want to keep him on the throne and they'll have that, I think, in their back pocket. But you know, they, they've got like one hand on the steering wheel and the car's got some tires falling off. And I just don't know that I see China being able to to root this in a direction that's going to be ultimately will serve their interest. But for now, in the short term, it's a very good deal for China to import right. those hydrocarbons at reduced rates and export their manufactured goods to Russia and usurp, usurp Russia's throw weight all over the world. As long as it lasts, it lasts. Good and when it's over, it's over. And uh, I think that's I think at some point China will there will be a day of reckoning and Xi Jinping will have to decide whether carrying on with Vladimir Putin is worth the cost in other ways to China. And, and if Russia were to one thing we haven't discussed, but if Russia were to I don't believe they will launch a tactical nuclear weapon. I'm not even sure Putin's own chain of command would even would even sign off on it. But the Ukrainian head of military intelligence, General Budanov, and again, he may be attempting to influence, not inform, has said that Russia has planted a lot of explosives at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. And if that were to go boom- Man, I mean, why do we have to say that? I mean, the Russians blew up Nord Stream 2, now they're going to blow up their own uh, well, nuclear power plant. I mean, we're serious people. Why are we spreading this information what the bits here? I mean, I'm, I'm attributing it to- It's not to, warranted, to, really. But I'm attributing it to General Budana, but I'm just telling you that Ukraine would have no interest in doing it. And it's a, really? an intelligence requirement for the United States for sure, to track on what could be a massive nuclear accident that would, you know, cause extraordinary damage, far worse than what Chernobyl caused. There's concern over the the fact that um, that sits right in the middle of the war zone, and bad things could happen as a result. So I just I, I emphasize that as another thing for the intelligence community to be thinking about here. But again, this is all Vladimir Putin's doing, all of it. And if he hadn't launched this war, we wouldn't be in this place. And there are massive war crimes that have been committed, and he'll have his own day of reckoning in hell for that. Thank you, Dan. Dan, uh, I'm going to look to Alexander. Alexander, some uh, your last question, comment, and then uh, I'll close it, please, Alexander. Okay, I, uh, you know, I just say that I would like to say that there is so much that we still don't know about uh, the uh, Prigozhin's uh, "quote unquote" insurrection. Uh, I mean, I'm really impressed then with your uh, degree of uh, certainty about what happened. I don't have that much certainty that I know uh, or even can guess what happened there. Uh, it's pretty inconsequential. Uh, we're not going to talk about it a month from now. It fizzled out and uh, uh, again, we know how Putin deals with uh, his real challenges, uh, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, there are different ways you mentioned some of them, how these people uh, disappear from the political stage. If he really had felt threatened about Prigozhin, this guy would not have been around anymore. Uh, and so I still maintain that this was an imitation uh, of uh, an insurrection, a charade, if you wish. Um, again, uh, it takes time uh, for more uh, facts to come out. I'm sure they will uh, once the dust settles. 
and uh, we will be all surprised. But my question, final question is, uh, you know, you were struggling to uh, outline the end game, uh, but what about the process at least? Do you believe that diplomacy can still work to restore peace and stability in this region, or is it all about the military action at this point and diplomacy, uh, at least until the end of Biden's administration has no place here. Maybe if a different administration comes to power, there will be an opening. But what's your view on the role of diplomacy in clearing the debris and bringing us towards uh, uh, some resolution of this conflict? Thank you, Alexander. Okay, so two quick points. I think, and again, this is a hypothesis. I don't have certainty. As I said, it's, you can't be certain about much, especially with Russia. But as far as why you don't kill Prigozhin right away, he has a lot of followers. Remember, a lot of guys who, who walked into the Rostov military district and took it over. So Putin, I think, would have risked even worse uh, issues with his own military had he immediately taken action against Prigozhin. And he would have risked real bloody civil war over that. Maybe that may have been one calculation on his part. As far as diplomacy is concerned, sure, great. But Vladimir Putin has to call off his army first. The reason Ukraine is fighting is because they're defending themselves against a Russian brutal onslaught. So we shouldn't hold ourselves accountable for diplomacy. That's over to Russia. Stop fighting and there can be diplomacy. But I agree with Prigozhin, believe it or not. Russia had no reason, no right to launch the war in the first place. And you can ask all those Ukrainian families who've been displaced or the families of the dead Ukrainian civilians. I mean, why? You know, that's, that's just Vladimir Putin's doing, the ultimate hubris to launch that sort of war. And uh, so, uh, sure, diplomacy is fine, but that's, the onus is not on the West for that. You, the onus is on, is on Russia. And, and the way you get there is by defeating Russia on the battlefield. I, I certainly believe that. And my, my criticism of the Biden administration is just that we haven't done enough to help Ukraine fast enough. And uh, that's you why want to the defeat the nuclear power on the battlefield. The, the only way that we get to an, a, an end result, a resolution of this is through the battlefield. That's why a, a resol a, something that would suit our interests. Now, it would not have been good for, for the United States national security if Vladimir Putin had taken Kiev. So thank goodness he didn't. Uh, and we can thank Ukraine's courageous, courageous fighters for, for that. Uh, but if we're in it to, to prevent Russia from launching a, a further attacks down the road against Ukraine, then you know Ukraine has to win. That's my opinion. They've got to kick thank Russia out of Crimea and kick them out of Donbass. Right. We'll see what happens. Thank you, Dan. Dan, let right, me just uh, thank you. No, these, this an excellent presentation and, and a very excellent uh, discussion uh, with Alexander and myself. Uh, Dan, let me, let, the last question I have for you, Dan, is, it was mentioned that uh, Putin uh, has significant popularity still in Russia, uh, some uh, over 80%, I think Alexander mentioned. Uh, I find that hard to understand. Why would he be popular in, in Russia having invaded uh, this uh, country <laughs> that, that Russia provided security assurances to in 1994 as did the US and the United Kingdom? And, and then seeing the, the loss of lives and the destruction going on and, and, and the element of oligarchs, you talked about a kleptocracy. Why would Putin still be popular in a country like that? Why wouldn't there be a sort of a, and that's where I could see the populist Prigozhin uh, rallying the people to say, we need a different type of leadership here. Why is he still popular? So a few points on that. First and foremost, I have never been one to trust the polls too much. Russians are really careful about what they say publicly. Uh, even on the phone, you know, they're so cautious about, I, they'll, uh, one of the most common things a Russian would say, it's not a conversation for the phone. So they're not going to answer polling questions the way we would. And I don't know how popular Vladimir Putin or, is or isn't and whether Russians blame the Ministry of Defense or others for the failures in Ukraine and not the czar. Uh, those are things that will be debated perhaps down the road. 
Um, but the thing that I would emphasize, one of the successes of Vladimir Putin over the past 20 years is he's, he's enforced a level of apathy among the Russian population. He said to them, look, after the 1990s, where everything in this country was falling apart, and we had the financial crisis in 1998, I will give you stability, and you will give me political power to deal with our foreign uh, adversaries as I see fit. And that was a pretty good deal for Russians until this war against Ukraine. But the population writ large is apathetic. They left. They, they didn't stay. Those million Russians who fled uh, and, and composed this brain drain didn't stay to overthrow Vladimir Putin. Uh, they left. And Putin has control of a massive security apparatus that, that tamps down on any dissent whatsoever. Uh, maybe the only ones who, who get away with it are the mothers of, of dead Russian soldiers who can come out and protest the war. But that's pretty limited. It's, a, it's not the police state that North Korea is or that China is, but it's, it's close enough. And I think that's why we're not seeing any sort of a populist uprising. I definitely don't expect to see that. Okay, thank you, Dan. What an outstanding presentation and what a great session. Daniel Hoffman, thank you so much for what you do, what you've done and what you continue to do. I think your insights are just invaluable. D Dr. Mansadoff, as always, thank you so much. Michael Jenkins, over to you, sir. Thank you, Joe. And uh, I also can't thank uh, Mr. Daniel Hoffman enough for this program today. It gave us great insights and understanding. And I want to thank uh, also Dr. Mansadoff. He is always very effective with counterpoints and challenging uh, the, the political correctness uh, sometimes. And uh, we appreciate that. Um, the Washington Times will be covering this program. I want to thank Chris Dolan, uh, president of the Washington Times, for that, and Guy Taylor, also the international security team leader. And uh, they have always they have done a very great uh, work of supporting this effort to communicate the key issues in Northeast Asia and also in in Europe. Uh, we are looking forward to uh, developing the program even further. Uh, today is July 4th. Uh, we're celebrating our national independence. Uh, it's a great day for America to remember our roots. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And uh, as we celebrate this holiday, we are also having our program on this holiday. So we know that some of our viewers will be uh, you know, celebrating and will not be able to join the program. And therefore, we are also going to uh, run the program again tomorrow on July 5th, on Wednesday, July 5th at 4 p.m. And you'll be receiving a notice on that. I uh, especially wanna thank Congressman John Doolittle, who is our congressional liaison um, and also helps advise us on uh, matters going on with Congress and how the brief can also address some of those issues. Uh, I also want to uh, thank uh, all of the uh, UPF Foundation for supporting this program. And we look forward to uh, the next program um, next month on the first Tuesday of every month, we're here. Uh, again, uh, Ambassador Dutrani, thanks for your leadership for peace. And Dr. Manzaroff, and especially Mr. Daniel Hoffman, thank you also for uh, contributing so much to the Washington Times with your op-eds. It's uh, very, very helpful and gives great insight to uh, the intelligence and the uh, State Department and Congress and uh, also the whole administration, including the White House. The Washington Times has a very good reach and it also is a global reach. Uh, we have our sister papers around the world. So thank you, everyone. And I, I hope this is a great holiday for you yes. in America as is so critical to world peace. And that's why we're doing this program to strengthen our core values uh, upon which America was founded and, and also bring understanding of how we can advance uh, peace in the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>